Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered together today on the 2nd of the 11th month, which happens to be January 14th on the Gregorian calendar for 2023. And we are continuing with our reading of the book of Hanok or Enoch, where he has already went through the condemnation or the reprimand of the watchers, if you will. We learned about the things that they had brought to men, the problems that they caused they and their children, and then the judgment of our creator against them for those things that they did. After that, he started being shown all of creation. He was brought into the Shamayim. He, he saw the presence of the father, the host of the messengers. He was made like one for a while. And now he's being taken and shown all of how creation actually is. It mentions, I believe, in the book of Yobelim that he was from his 365th year to like his 500th year being shown all these things. And then he went down for a year to, to teach his children and leave them the writings that he had. And then he was taken from mankind again. But we'll get to that when we get there. Currently, we are in chapter 18, and he's still being shown how creation is. So it says, I saw the treasures of all the winds. I saw how he had furnished with them the whole creation and the firm foundations of the land. Now, when we get the winds, what we think of as wind here is also electromagnetism which is what helps move the currents and the luminaries. And then the actual winds, which produces, which, which carries the pollen, which helps fertilize trees. And then the ruach, or the breath of the Almighty, through which things actually have life. These winds are also what move, the, he says, the firmament, or what we call the ether, which is actually measurable. There are some scientific experiments in the 1800s that covered that. They tried to discern whether or not it was the earth that moved or the ether, and they realized that it was the ether through experiments. But that's why they came up with Einstein's theory of relativity to muddy up those waters and hide the fact. This is, and I saw the cornerstone of the land. I saw the four winds which bear the land and the firmament of the Shamayim. If you remember, Irenaeus or Irenaeus mentions that the four winds line up with the four good news accounts, which line up with the four living creatures, which line up with the four manifestations of our Mashiach in how he came and, and showed himself to the world. And I saw how the winds stretch out the vaults of the Shamayim and have their station between the Shamayim and the land. These are the pillars of the Shamayim. I saw the winds of the Shamayim which turn and bring the circumference of the sun and all the stars to their going down. I saw the winds of the land carrying the clouds. I saw the paths of the messengers. I saw at the end of the land and firmament of the Shamayim above. And I proceeded and saw a place which burns day and night, where there are seven mountains of magnificent stones, three towards the east and three towards the south. And as for those towards the east, one was of colored stone and one of pearl and one of janseth and those towards the south of red stone. But the middle one reached toward the Shamayim, like the throne of Elohim, of alabaster, and the summit of the throne was of sapphire. Alabaster is like white, like kind of like marble or ivory in color. And then, if you remember, it mentions a sapphire throne, I think, in Yehezkiahu or Ezekiel, and also in the book of Gad the Seer. I might be wrong about Gad the Seer, but it mentions the sapphire throne for him in the Shamayim above as well. And I saw a flaming fire, and beyond these, 
mountains is a region, the end of the great land. There the Shamayim were completed. And I saw a deep abyss with columns of fire of the Shamayim. And among them I saw columns of fire fall, which were beyond measure, alike towards the height and towards the depth. And beyond that abyss I saw a place which had no firmament of the Shamayim above, and no firmly founded land beneath it. There was no water upon it, and no birds, but it was a waste and a horrible place. So this is a place beyond what was created, beyond the firmament, beyond the land, the waters, or anything that was in it. It's just desolate. I saw the seven stars like great burning mountains, and to me, when I inquired regarding them, the messenger said, This place is the end of the Shemaim and land. This has become a prison of the stars and the host of the Shemaim. And the stars which roll over the fire are they which have transgressed the command of Yahuwah in the beginning of their rising because they did not come forth at their appointed times. And he was wroth with them, and bound them till the time when their guilt should be completely ended, for ten thousand years. Now, in the book of the Recognitions of Clement, it mentions that the created things like the sun, they do what they're, they don't get punished, and they do their things without reward, because they're not sent, they don't have free will. Right here, you have the illusion of stars having free will, and when they did not come at the beginning of their rising, they're punished. The stars are also known as messengers and his children. So when you put these in their proper context, you can see what, what it can mean. And you have to keep in mind that this is an abridged version of what was originally written. There might be some things here that are not quite as accurate as they should be but you can generally get the idea of what's going on. And this is actually repeated. There's a couple sections here that have it mentioned twice. You'll, we'll read this in just a minute again. And Oriel, the light of El, said to me, or El is light, if you will. He said to me, here shall stand the messengers who have connected themselves with women and their ruachoth, or spirits, assuming many different forms, are defiling mankind and shall lead them astray as to sacrificing to demons as mighty ones till the day of the great judgment in which they shall be rightly ruled till they are made an end of. And the women also of the messengers who went astray shall become demons meaning all the women that decided to mate with the messengers and have those giants are not going to be left unpunished. They also will be like demons, like their children. And I, Hanok, alone saw the vision, the end of all matters, and no man shall see as I have seen. Chapter 20. And these are the names of the Kodesh messengers that watch. Oriel one of the Kodesh messengers who is over the world and Gehenna. Raphael, one of the Kodesh messengers who is over the inner beings of men. Raguel, one of the Kodesh messengers who take vengeance on the world of the lights. Oriel is the light of El. Raphael is El is my healer or the healing of El. Raguel is like where you get the word for Ragnarok or the sons of right, uh, the Bene Regis, right? The sons of thunder, it was called, but it's the thundering of El. Mikael is who is like El, one of the Kodesh messengers. In order that he is appointed over the best part of mankind and over disorder. If you remember, it's in the book of Daniel that only Mikael was helping our Mashiach, and he was over the children of Yisrael specifically. In the Shepherd of Hermas, it's made known that Mikael, the one who is like El, as his name implies, 
is set over the pious un the unsinning portion of his people and whenever they fall astray it's his job to give them over to correction to hand them over to the shepherd for for, for or over to our mashiach for repentance or over to those appointed to correct them so he is over the best part of mankind and over disorder and then sarah kael one of the kodesh messengers who was appointed over the inner beings who sin in the ruach or spirit I, i'm not sure what that name is i have to look it up gabriel which is the mighty man of el one of the kodesh messengers who was over paradise and and the serpents and the cherubim and ramiel which is the exalted of el or el is exalted one of the kodesh messengers whom elohim had appointed over those who rise chapter 21 actually just one moment okay so we looked up the word for sarak it's either samik resh kof or sheen resh kof and they both have a similar meaning for to comb or to search and he's the one who searches the innermost parts of a man which is why this one was appointed over the inner beings who sin in the ruach all right thank you for that and then we can move on to chapter 21 it says and i proceeded to where matters were disordered and i saw there some horrible matter i saw neither a shamayim above nor a firmly founded land but a place disorderly and horrible and there I saw seven stars of the Shemaim bound together in it, like great mountains and burning with fire. So you see, it's a repeat, whether it was intentional or, or not. This is a repeat of what we just kind of covered. And you see that a few times where he'll gloss over the four winds, and then later on he'll go over them in more detail. So perhaps that was the pattern for showing two witnesses to confirm every matter in this one book alone just like you can see repeats of things like in Bereshit and then Yobelim or you have Kings and Chronicles and things of that nature where you have the two witnesses to confirm matters then I said for what sin are they bound and on what account have they been cast in here then spoke Oriel one of the Kodesh messengers who was with me and was chief over them, and said, Hanok, why do you ask and why are you eager for the truth? These are the number of the stars of the Shamayim, which have transgressed the command of Yahuwah and are bound here till 10,000 years. The time entailed by their sins are ended. And from there I went to another place which was still more horrible than the former. And I saw a horrible matter, a great fire there which burnt and blazed. And a place, or and the place was divided as far as the abyss, being full of great descending columns of fire. Neither its extent or magnitude could I see, nor could I guess. Then said I, how fearful is the place and how terrible to look upon. Then Oriel answered me, one of the Kodesh messengers who was with me, and said to me, Hanok, why have you such fear and terror? And I answered, because of this fearful place and because of the spectacle of the pain. And he said to me, this place, place is the prison of the messengers and here they will be imprisoned forever or for ages chapter 22 and then i went to another place and he showed me in the west another great and high mountain of hard rock and there was in it four hollow places deep and wide and very smooth how smooth are the hollow places and deep and dark to look at. 
Then Raphael answered, one of the Kodesh messengers who was with me, and said to me, These hollow places have been created for this very purpose, that the inner beings of the beings of the dead should assemble there, even that all the inner beings of the children of men should assemble there. So you see, they're not non-existent when they die. The soul is immortal, or the inner being, if you will, is immortal, and it has a place of habitation after the body is passed away. And this is also expounded on in the book of Fourth Ezra, as it's called, the Josephus or Yahusuf's discourse to the Greeks on Hades and a few other places. It's also alluded to in scripture where you have the inner being or the blood of Havel, Abel, crying out from the ground where the life or the, it says the life is in the blood, but that word is not life. It's the word for nephesh, the soul or the inner being is in the blood and it, it lives beyond the body and cries out until, uh, we've read that part already, but it just reaffirms that the soul or the inner being of a man is immortal and it doesn't pass away with the body, and you don't physically sleep or cease to know what's going on. You're just taken out of the world to your place of habitation. It says, and these places have been made to receive them till the day of their judgment, and till their appointed time, till the great judgment upon them. I saw the inner being of the children of men who were dead, and their voice went forth to the Shemaim and petitioned. And I asked Raphael, the messenger who was with me, and I said to him, This inner being, whose is it? Or whose is it whose voice goes forth in petitions? And he answered me, saying, This is the inner being which went forth from Havel, or Abel, whom his brother Cain slew. And he makes his petition against him till his seed is destroyed from the face of the land, and his seed is annihilated from the seed of men. Because as he did to his brother, killing him and not leaving him an heir in the, in the land, so he's petitioning to have done to his brother in return by Yahuwah. And this is why it says that the blood of our Mashiach speaks better than the blood of Havel. Because the blood of Havel cried out for reformation, for recompense, and, and for his annihilation out of the earth, where our Mashiach seeks to have all men repent like the will of the Father. Then I asked regarding it and regarding all the hollow places, why is one separated from the other? And he answered me and said to me, These three have been made that the inner beings of the dead might be separated. And such a division has been made for the inner beings of, of the righteous, in which there is the bright spring water. And such has been made for sinners, when they die and are buried in the land and judgment has not been executed on them in their lifetime. Here their inner beings shall be put aside in this great pain till the great day of judgment and torment of the accursed forever and retribution for their inner beings. There he shall bind them forever. And such a division has been made for the inner being who make their petition, who make disclosures concerning their destruction when they were slain in the days of the sinners. Such has been made for the inner beings of men who were not righteous, but sinners, who were complete in transgression, and of the transgressors they shall be companions. But their inner beings shall not be slain in the day of judgment, nor shall they be raised from here, meaning their bodies will be returned to them, and then they'll be thrown into the lake of fire. They will not ascend back onto the land, and they will not be killed, or they will not cease to exist. Then I, Barak Yahuwah of esteem, and said, Baruch be Adonai Yahuwah of righteousness, 
who rules forever. Chapter 23. From there I went to another place to the west of the ends of the land, and I saw a burning fire which run without resting, and did not cease from its course day or night, but regularly. And I asked, saying, What is this which does not rest? Then Raguel, one of the Kodesh messengers who was with me, answered me and said to me, This course of fire which you have seen is the fire in the west which pursues all the lights of the Shemaim. And I don't know if you're all familiar, but there's constant lava flow building new islands and things of that nature. This was something that he saw at that time, but it's also a figure you see with the um, the setting of the sun. You have the streak of light that follows it towards you, right? These are all true. Whether or not it means one or the other or both is to be seen in a later time. Chapter 24. It says, And from there I went to another place of the land, and he showed me a mountain range of fire that burned day and night. And I went beyond it and saw seven magnificent mountains, all differing from each other. And the stones were magnificent and pleasant, magnificent as a whole, of magnificent appearance and of fair exterior, three toward the east, one founded on the other, and three toward the south, one upon the other and deep, rough ravines, none of which joined with any other. And the seventh mountain was in the midst of these, and it excelled them in height, resembling the seat of a throne, and fragrant trees encircled the throne. And amongst them was a tree such as I had never yet smelled. Neither was any amongst them, nor were others like it. It had a fragrance beyond all fragrance, and its leaves and blooms and wood wither not forever. And its fruit is pleasant, and its fruit resembles the dates of a palm. Then I said, How pleasant is this tree, and fragrant, and its leaves are fair, and its blooms very delightful in appearance. Then answered Mikael, one of the Kodesh and honored messengers who was with me, and was their leader. 25. And he said to me, Hanok, why do you ask me regarding the fragrance of the tree, and why do you want to learn the truth? Then I answered him, saying, I want to know about all matters but especially about this tree. And he answered, saying, This high mountain which you have seen, whose summit is like the throne of Elohim, is his throne. Where the Kodesh Great One, Yahuwah of Esteem, the Eternal King, will sit when he shall come down to visit the earth with goodness. And as for this fragrant tree, no mortal is permitted to touch it till the great judgment, when he shall take vengeance on all and bring to its end forever. It shall then be given to the righteous and Kodesh, or set apart. Its fruit shall be for food to the elect. It shall be transplanted to the Kodesh place, to the temple of Yahuwah, the eternal king. Then shall they rejoice with a joy and be glad. And into the Kodesh place they shall enter, and its fragrance shall be in their bones, and they shall live a long life on earth or the land, such as your fathers lived. And in their days shall no sorrow or plague or torment or calamity touch them. And that's also mentioned where there's in the foretellers where it says there will be a time where there's no more tears or sorrow and these things won't be remembered anymore. I believe it's also in the, at the end in the book of Revelation. 
Then I, Barak, the Elohim of esteem, the eternal king, who has prepared such matters for the righteous and has created them and promised to give to them. Chapter 26. And I went from there to the middle of the land, and I saw a Baruch place in which there were trees with branches abiding and blooming. And there I saw a Kodesh mountain, and underneath the mountain to the east there was a stream, and it flowed towards the south. And I saw towards the east another mountain higher than this, and between them a deep and narrow ravine, wherein also ran a stream underneath the mountain. And to the west of there was another mountain, lower than the former and of small height, and the ravine deep and dry between them, and another dry and deep ravine, er, a deep and dry ravine was at the extremities of these of the three mountains. And all the ravines were deep and narrow of hard rock, and trees were not planted upon them. And I marveled at the rocks, and I marveled at the ravine. Truly, I marveled very much. All right, chapter 27. And again, some of these places are easier to know. Some of them are actually mentioned in different commentaries or where they might be if you take the time to look up what other men had saw and studied about this book. There is the version on the sacredtext.com that talks about one of the seas is the Arethian Sea. Or I'm not saying that right, but it's known as the Gulf of Aden today, which is by the Horn of Africa and and the Sinai Peninsula or Saudi Arabia, one of the two. So it, some of these areas are more well known and some of them it, not so much. But again, if you have the right concept of what the creation looks like, it's easier to see. It says, then I said, for what purpose is this Baruch land, which is entirely filled with trees and this accursed valley between? Then Oriel, one of the Kodesh messengers who was with me, answered and said, This accursed valley is for those who are accursed forever. Here shall all the accursed be gathered together, who utter with their lips against Yahuwah indecent words, and of his esteem speak harshness. Here shall they be gathered together, and here shall their place of judgment, or in here shall be their place of judgment in the last days. There shall be upon them the spectacle of righteous judgment in the presence of the righteous forever. Here shall all the compassionate Barak Yahuwah of esteem, the eternal king. In the days of judgment over the former, they shall barak him for the compassion in accordance with which he has assigned them. Then I barak Yahuwah of esteem and proclaimed his esteem and exalted him magnificently. Chapter 28 And I then, or then I went towards the east into the midst of the mountain range of the desert and I saw a wilderness, and it was solitary, full of trees and plants. And water gushed forth from above, rushing like a plentiful watercourse towards the northwest. It caused clouds and dew to ascend on every side. Chapter 29. And then I went to another place in the desert, and approached to the east of this mountain range. And there I saw aromatic trees exhaling the fragrance of frankincense and myrrh, and the trees also were similar to the almond tree. Chapter 30 
And beyond these I went far to the east, and saw another place, a valley of water. And therein there was a tree, the color of fragrant trees such as the mastic or gum tree. And on the sides of those valleys I saw fragrant cinnamon, and beyond these I proceeded to the east. I don't know how well you all are familiar with geography or where these things are actually located, but they have in the eastern countries, I know in the Philippines, they have their own unique type of cinnamon trees and they have them in other places there as well. Chapter 31. And I saw other mountains and amongst them were groves of trees and their nectar flowed forth from them, which is named Sararar and Galbanum. And beyond these mountains I saw another mountain to the east of the ends of the land, whereon were aloe trees, and all the trees were full of stactite, which is one of the things that they used for incense in the Hikel. Being like almond trees, and when one burnt it, it smelled sweeter than any fragrant odor. Chapter 32 And after these fragrant odors, as I looked towards the north over the mountains, I saw seven mountains full of choice nard and fragrant trees and cinnamon and pepper. And then I went over the summits of all these mountains, far towards the east of the land, and passed above the eastern sea, and went far from it, and passed over the messenger Zotiel. Now, we're about to read where he comes from, but Zotiel, that Zot, means a little thing, or like it's a little thing of El whether that means insignificant or it was a small matter for him to do this, I can't say. But this is the messenger that had, or with the flaming sword, that guards the way to the, to the Garden of Eden and the Tree of Life. Verse 4, it says, And I came to the Garden of Righteousness, and saw beyond those trees many large trees growing there, and of pleasant fragrance, large, very pleasant, and great, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, of which they ate and know knowledge of good and evil. Now, in just a moment, I want to share with you both versions of the book of Hanok that I'm familiar with actually say this the tree of wisdom, in which they ate of it and they were get they get great wisdom. But uh, we'll we'll mention that. I'll show you in just a moment. Okay, why that isn't accurate. It says, then I said, how lovely is the tree and how good to look at. Then Raphael, the Kodesh messenger who was with me, answered me and said, this is the, no or this is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, of which your elderly father and your aged mother who were before you have eaten, and they learn knowledge of good and evil. And their eyes were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they were driven out of the garden. So that's the context for who that messenger was. And Ob willing, you, you all know and are familiar with that story. It wasn't a tree of wisdom that they were eating from, but it was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So just one moment. Okay, so this is the website, the sacred text that I was telling you about. They have a lot of the sacredtext.com. They have a lot of the books of scripture and the extra writings, the book of Hanok, the shepherd of Hermas. They also have a lot of Gnostic writings and things I can't recommend. But it's a great resource because they usually have pretty decent translations on here. However, right here, you can see that there's 
two different manuscripts or two different versions of the book of Hanok, and they show both and what they what one is missing and what the other one has. But right here in both versions of this chapter, it mentions that there is that tree that gives wisdom, the tree of wisdom, whereof they that eat and know great wisdom, right? And that's done twice. Now, it it's a Gnostic belief, or it's a Satanic belief, contrary to the truth, that Satan deceived men and gave them the fruits of knowledge, or gave them of the fruit there to give them knowledge and to give them wisdom so that they would be knowing. And it was for the benefit of man that that happened. I believe, I don't know as a fact, but I know that it was the first mention of this anywhere. But in the recognitions of Clement, when Simon the magician, is disputing with Kepha, that very belief is, is put forward by him, and it's satanic. So this right here is trying to confirm that kind of Gnostic belief that it was a benefit for men to eat of it, and that it gave them wisdom, when that's not what you can actually read in scripture. So I wanted to go right here and just cover real quick what it says in Genesis. It says, the woman, she has indeed uh, this is when the serpent bears sheet or Genesis chapter three, right? And this is when the serpent who is more cunning, right? Or more clever than all the beasts of the field indwelt with Satan or God Riel, the messenger who deceived Hua that we read about. And he shows her of every tree. He asked her about that. Who, what were you told? And she says that you're not of to eat of the tree in the midst of the garden you shall not eat of it nor touch it which is not what he'd actually said and then the serpent lies to her and then she looks upon it right so i just wanted to get to that point right and it says the woman looked at the tree and saw that it was good for food and pleasant to the eyes and desirable to make one wise. But this is literally lahashakil, to make one intelligent. And she took and ate thereof. So it was of her own opinion. And if you've ever heard of Alexander Hislop's Two Babylons, he actually shows that the false female mighty one, Rhea, which is the Greek version of Ra'a or the gazer, comes from this episode with Hua in the mystery religions where she saw the tree that it was good and pleasant to the eyes and ate thereof. But back on point. Oh, this doesn't actually show what it was called. I wanted to get to the point where it shows that it's called the knowledge or the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and not the tree of wisdom. So it was her, in her own eyes, it was something that would make her wise or intelligent. And that was at the instigation of the serpent. Just one moment and we'll see the other part. Okay, so this is Bereshit or Genesis chapter 2. And we are currently looking at uh, verse 9, right? And it says, And he made grow Yahuwah Elohim out of the ground every tree that is pleasing to the sight. And good for food, right? And the tree of life, ha chayim, in the midst of the garden, and the tree, ha da'at tov wa which is uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This is what that tree was. It has nothing to do with wisdom. So, you can see where that comes from. The next verse where the next chapter shows the serpent deceiving Hua and her seeing that it was to make her intelligent or wise. And that's where that doctrine originally started. Now, if you give me just one moment, we'll we'll show you. I'll I'll show you where it's at in the recognitions by Simon the Magician. And then we'll look real quick at the scripture verses for wisdom in the Bible that you can see where wisdom actually comes from or what they call chokmah. So please give me one moment. All right, thank you again, everyone. This is 
what's called the recognitions of Clement, which between it and what's called the homilies, the Clementine homilies, they're two versions of the preachings and teaching of Kepha, kind of like the book of Acts covers what Shaul was doing. These books cover what Kepha was doing when he went out to go to the lost children or lost tribes of Israel. I'm not sure if there's any other books that were ever written like this recording what the other emissaries did, but it would have been amazing if we had them still. Ob willing, eventually we will. But as of right now, I don't know of them. This is from the Recognitions of Clement, however, Book 2, Chapter 53. And it has to do with Simon the Magician and Kepha when they were disputing with each other for three days before he fled and the people turned wholeheartedly to the truth that were in Caesarea Stratanos or Caesarea, if you will. <clears throat> this is chapter 53, book two. This is called Shimon's Blasphemy or Simon the Magician. And then it says, then says Shimon, listen. It is manifest to all and ascertained in a manner of which no account can be given. To back up real quick, just so you can see what he's doing. It says, then Shimon said, if you have done laughing, I will prove it by clear assertions. Then Kepha said, assuredly, we, I will give over that I may learn from you how you have learned from Torah what neither Torah nor the Yahuwah of the Torah himself knows. So that's why he was laughing, because they thought that was an absurd idea. But he says, listen, it is manifest to all and ascertained in a manner of which no account can be given, that there is one king who is better than all, from whom all that is took its beginning, whence also of necessity all things that are after him are subject to him as the chief and most excellent of all. When, therefore, I had ascertained that the Eloah who created the world, according to what Torah teaches, is in many respects weak, whereas weakness is utterly incompatible with a perfect Elohim. And I saw that he is not perfect. I necessarily concluded that there is another who is perfect. <clears throat> For this Elohim, as I have said, according to what the writing of Torah teaches, is shown to be weak in many things. In the first place, because the man whom he formed was not able to remain such as he had intended him to be. And this is spoken in ignorance by someone who's indwelled with, with Satan, just so you know. That's why... He, he makes these arguments to try to be persuasive and show that our creator is weak because he doesn't know that he gave man free will. And of necessity, that means you can choose not to do the right thing, which is later on expounded and explained by Kepha. So I highly recommend reading these. It has amazing arguments and amazing answers to questions that many, many people might have. But continuing, it says... And because he cannot be good who gave Torah to the first man, that or gave instruction, which is what Torah means, to the first man, that he should eat of all the trees of paradise, but that he should not touch the tree of knowledge. And if he should eat of it, he should die. For why should he forbid him to eat and to know what is good and what evil? and that knowing he might shun the evil and choose the good. But this he did not permit, and because he did not, or, and because he did eat in violation of the commandment, and discovered what is good, and learned for the sake of honor to cover his nakedness, for he perceived it to be unseemly to stand naked before his creator. He condemns to death him who had learned to do honor to Elohim and curses the serpent who had shown him these things. You see, Simon the magician sees this as a bad thing. But truly, if man was to be injured by this means, why did he place the cause of injury in paradise at all? But if that which he placed in paradise was good, 
It is not the part of the one that is good to restrain another from good. All right, and just like the, the serpent twists things and makes it confusing and tries to justify or declare right their own actions of disobedience through wordplay or whatever, or false reasoning, he's doing the same here. But like I said, this is the first mention, and it's a satanic idea from Simon the Magician that this was a thing that was not bad in itself. The Gnostics explain or can continue in that, and it's even a belief in witchcraft is, is far into today's, I believe John Todd talks about it as well, where they believe that it was the serpent that gave man wisdom or secret knowledge by letting him eat of the tree. All right, in just one moment, we'll go over what the uh, the word says about wisdom, and then we can move on real quick. So the actual origin and source of where chokmah comes from, which the word wisdom is chokmah in scripture or in Hebrew, and that has to do with tasting and seeing what is good for you. Literally, it's the palate and what is on the palate, right? Hok or hak is the palate. It's also to um, to chew up dates and stick it in the roof of a child's mouth to learn for them to taste what is good and wean them off milk. And then ma in Hebrew is what? Like mana is what is it? Where we get the word for manna. But it says, who is hakam or wise and comprehending among you? Let him show by their good life or good works by deeds done in humility that comes from chokmah, right? And it says, is it not chokmah found among the aged? Or not that one, sorry. For Yahuwah, this is the source of it, for Yahuwah gives chokmah. From his mouth come knowledge and comprehension. From, the, from Yahuwah and his word, not from a tree. The beginning of chokmah is get chokmah, or wisdom, and though it costs all you have, get comprehension. All right, we'll continue here. How much better to get chokmah than gold and to get insight or comprehension than silver? All right, if they show Proverbs 8, it mentions who is chokmah, right? The one who gets wisdom or chokmah loves life. The one who cherishes comprehension will soon prosper, right? See, chokma is found in those who take advice, which is the advice that we get from his word. The fear of Yahuwah is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise chokma, wisdom, and instruction okay do not be wise or intelligent and clever in your own eyes like hua thought to do but fear yahua and shun evil which is evil is not doing what he said right and the fear of yahu is the beginning of chokma okay A wise or hakim son heeds his father's instruction, which is our father above. Okay. There's a few more here. So to the person who pleases him, Elohim gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. Very clear. It comes by obedience to the truth. And we'll see that again when we look, if you find Proverbs 8 here. If any of you lacks wisdom or chokmah, you should ask of Elohim who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Prosperous are those who find wisdom and those who gain comprehension. Well, that's the end of that one. Apparently, they don't have it, so I'll go ahead and look that up real quick. But anyone that wants to follow along, this would just be in... Um, Proverbs, Tehillim, or uh, Mishli, sorry, Proverbs chapter 8. Give me one. All right, so 
I don't have it on the screen here, but if you go to Proverbs or Mishli chapter 8, it literally starts with, does not hokma or wisdom call and comprehension lift up her voice, meaning the, the Ruach, which is speaking the words of Mashiach and coming from him and not doing anything different from his will, right? And then it goes on. I highly suggest you, you read the whole thing, but if you get to verse 10, it goes, accept my discipline and not silver and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than rubies and all delights are not comparable to her. And then it mentions right here, I, wisdom, have dwelt with insight, and I find knowledge foresight. The fear of Yahuwah is to hate evil. I have hated pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverse mouth. Counsel is mind and sound intelligence. I am comprehension. Mightiness is mine. All right. It goes on. I mean, the whole thing is pretty important. In verse 22, it says, Yahuwah possessed me, the beginning of his way, which our Mashiach is the firstborn of all creation, and he is the way, the truth, and the life. As the first of his works of old, I was set up, poured out, and anointed ages ago. That the word that word there for possessed, right? Or that word for set up literally means to be poured out like a libation offering or anointed. It's all three of those. But I was set up, anointed, and poured out ages ago at the first before the earth ever was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs heavy with water. Before mountains were sunk, and before the hills, I was brought forth. Before he had made the earth and the fields or the first dust of the world. When he prepared the Shamayim, I was there. When he inscribed a circle on the face of the deep. When he set the clouds above. When he made the fountains of the deep strong. When he gave to the sea its law so that the waters would not transgress his mouth. When he inscribed the foundations of the earth. Then I was beside him a master workman. And I was his delight day by day or his daily delight, which, if you remember, is mentioned in book of Gad the Seer, chapter 1, where he's, when the father is speaking to the son, and were you not my daily delight, right? Alluding to this very passage and speaking of who this is that was made as the first of his works through which he was the master workman doing all these things with him, which is also what you see in the beginning of the book of Yahukanon, and the fact that all things were made by him and through him and for him, what Shaul mentions. But he is the Hokma of Elohim manifested in the flesh, and he dwells with those who please our maker, which is mentioned elsewhere. Another place, then we'll look at that in just a minute, but another place where this directly mentions that this chapter, this very topic is speaking of our Mashiach, is in what's called the Apostolic Constitutions. So just give me one moment, we'll finish this, and then we'll look at that, and then we'll finish what we were reading here. This is, then I was beside him a master workman, and I was his daily delight, rejoicing before him all the time, rejoicing in the world, his earth, and my delights were with the sons of Adam. And now listen to me, you children, for prosperous are they who guard my ways. Listen to discipline and become wise and do not refuse it. Prosperous is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the posts of my doors. For whoever finds me shall find life and obtain favor from Yahuwah. But he who sins against me injures himself. All who hate me love death. And just one moment, you'll see that that was literally our Mashiach speaking. And those who find him find knowledge of the truth and so have eternal expectation if they stay true to him. All right, thank you for your patience. This is a post that was made in 2017. This is from the Apostolic Constitutions, Book 5. And it actually has to do with 
um, keeping the feasts. So it, this is just one of the end sections, and they start showing how our Mashiach was mentioned all throughout Scripture. And you, you can see that he is literally from the beginning, and they quote Proverbs 8 as being directly about him. So it's edifying to read the whole thing. We'll just do that real quick, and then we'll move on to the last part of the book of Hanok there. But this is a foretelling, <clears throat> excuse me, book five, chapter 20, a foretelling prediction concerning Mashiach Yahushua. It says, for even now, on the 10th day of the seventh month, when they assemble together, the Yahudim, okay, they read the lamentations of Yeremi Yahu, in which it is said, the Ruach before our face, Mashiach Yahuwah, was taken in their destructions. Lamentation 420. And when I first read that, I actually went to look in the Hebrew, and it does literally say Mashiach Yahuwah there. And in English, they put the word of when there is no, in the Hebrew, whenever it says the children of Yisrael, it would say B'nai Yisrael. So you'd have a Sere and then a Yod. And that denotes the next, it is of and then the next word. But you never see that when it says Mashiach Yahuwah anywhere. And he's called Mashiach Yahuwah in Lamentations 4.20. He's called the Mashiach Yahuwah in the book of Judges when he goes before the children. And they call it the messenger of, or he's called the messenger Yahuwah, but they call him the, the messenger of. And then he's called the Mashiach by Shemuel. And in the book of Luke, when our Mashiach was born and the messengers appear to the shepherds, they say there has been born in the city of Dawid a deliverer, Mashiach Yahuwah that very phrase, the same title that they gave to him. And if you know that he came in his father's name, it makes perfect sense. But that's for another time. <clears throat> and Baruch, in whom it is written, this is in second Baruch, by the way, this is our L, no other shall be esteemed with him. He found out every way of knowledge and showed it to Jacob, his son which in Yeshiyahu, in the King James Version and most modern translations, it says that he is the, uh, the different titles and names for our Mashiach. It calls him the everlasting father, but that's not true. The everlasting father is his father, who's greater than him. In the Septuagint Version, and it possibly is in other versions and manuscripts, but it calls him the father of the future age in which is absolutely true, because he is a father to Yaakov. He brought him forth and taught him truth, and he raised him and his children. So our Mashiach is a father, like the father above is the everlasting father, but he is the father of a future age, and he's the father of all the children of Yisrael. He's also known as the Kadosh Yisrael. You'll find this, again, especially in Yeshiyahu and other places where it says the set-apart one of Israel in English. That word for one is not in the Hebrew. It literally just says Kadosh Yisrael, or literally set-apart Yisrael, which is a title for our Mashiach because he is the perfect man. And that's why the foretelling says, I have loved Yisrael, and out of, or, and out of Mitzrayim I have called my son. And that's speaking of our Mashiach as well as when they called him out literally because we are his body. So Ab willing, these things will start to make more sense as we go along. But all of those things are connected. All right, so to long story short, our father and his father is the everlasting one or the self-existent one who did not come into being, as Kepha mentions. and in Yeshiyahu 53, where a child has been born unto us, his name and title there is the father of a future age, which is true. But it says, and he showed it to Jacob, his son, and Yisrael, or Yisrael, his beloved. 
afterwards he was seen upon earth and conversed with men. And that's from Baruch 3, 35 through 37. And when they read them, they lament and be well, as themselves suppose, that desolation which happened by Nebuchadnezzar, but as the truth shows, they unwillingly make a prelude to that lamentation which will overtake them, which is the destruction in 70 AD by Vespasian and Titus. Yet after ten days from the ascension, which from the first fruits is the fiftieth day, keep a great festival. For on that day at the third hour, Yahuwah Yahushua sent on us the gift of the Ruach HaKodesh, or the set-apart Ruach, and we were filled with his energy, and we spoke with new tongues, as that Ruach did suggest to us. Acts 2.4 and we preach both to Yahudi and Gentiles that he is the Mashiach of El, who is determined by him to be the judge of the quick and dead. Acts 10.24 To him, Mashiach, Yahuwah, Yahushua, okay, to him did Moshe bear witness and said, Yahuwah received fire from Yahuwah and rained it down. Bereshit or Genesis 19.24. Him did Jacob see as a man and said, I have seen El face to face, and my inner being is preserved. Genesis 32.20. Him did Abraham entertain and acknowledge to be the judge and his Yahuwah. Genesis or Bereshit 18.1-33. Him did Moshe see in the bush, concerning him did he speak in Deuteronomy. A foreteller will Yahuwah your Elohim raise up unto you out of your brethren, like me. Him shall you hear in all things, whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall be that every inner being that will not hear that foreteller shall be destroyed from among his people. Deuteronomy 18.15 him did Yahushua the son of Nun see, as the prince of Yahuwah's hosts, in armor for their assistance against Jericho, to whom he fell down and worshipped as a servant does to his master. Yahushua 5.14 Him Shemuel knew as the Mashiach of El, 1 Samuel 12.3 and thence or from there named the Kohanim and the kings the anointed. Him Dawid knew and sung a hymn concerning him, a song concerning the beloved. And this is literally a song by, it says usually in English, a song by David. But that word La Dawid can mean by David or concerning the beloved. And every time one of those is before a psalm, it's always either in his person as he's speaking or about our Mashiach directly and his body indirectly. <clears throat> so it says, and him concerning him, <clears throat> excuse me, a song concerning the beloved. And he adds in his person and says, gird your sword upon your thigh, you who are mighty in your beauty and renown. Go on and prosper and reign for the sake of truth and meekness and righteousness. And your right hand shall guide you after a wonderful manner. Your darts are sharpened, you that are mighty. The people shall fall under you in the heart of the king's enemies. Wherefore, Elohim, your Elohim, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your fellows. Psalm 45. Concerning him also spoke Shalomo as in his person, meaning speaking as if he was speaking from, our Mashiach was speaking from him. Yahuwah created me the beginning of his ways for his works. Before the world he founded me. In the beginning before he made the earth, before the fountains of waters came, before the mountains were fastened, he begat me before all the hills. Proverbs 8, 22 through 25. And again, 
Chokma, wisdom, built herself a house. Proverbs 9.1. So you can see he's directly called the wisdom or Chokma of Elohim, which is also mentioned in Ephesians, I believe, I believe by Shaul. He is the Chokma from Elohim. And the Ruach or spirit, which is given a feminine context, only says what it hears from him and does nothing of its own. It says, concerning him also, Yeshayahu said, a branch shall come out of the root of Yeshai or Jesse, and a flower shall spring out of his root, and there shall be a root of Yeshai. And he that is to rise to, to reign over the nations, in him shall the nations or Gentiles trust. Yeshayahu 11, 1 and 10. And Zakaryahu says, behold, your king comes unto you, righteous and having deliverance meek and riding upon a donkey, and upon a colt, the fowl of a donkey. If you remember, he does everything in parables, and the donkey represented the first covenant believers like Yishmael, those who hear, but they're stubborn, and they had to have a bit and bridle and constant correction. It was a colt, the, the female, and the donkey, right? The fowl of a donkey and a donkey. Because it was not just Yarushalayim that he came to in the original people, but it was after the captivity and return. All of it true and foretold in parable form and shown forth in his coming as the truth. So, Ab willing, these things will be more apparent as we continue on. And remember, Shaul makes the connection where the first covenant was Hagar at Mount Sinai which means the first covenant offspring were Yishmael, the wild donkey of a man whose hand was against every man and every man's hand against him, right? Him, Daniel describes as the son of Adam coming to the father and receiving all judgment and honor from him, Daniel 7, 13. And as the stone cut out of the mountain without hands and becoming a great mountain, and filling the whole earth and dashing to pieces the many governments of the smaller countries and the polytheism of false mighty ones, but preaching the one L, Daniel 2, 34. Concerning him also did Yeremi Yahu foretell, saying the Ruach before his face, Mashiach Yahuwah was taken in their snares, of whom we said, under his shadow we shall live among the nations, Lamentations 4.20. Yehezkiel, or Ezekiel also, and the following foretellers affirm everywhere that he is the Mashiach Yahuwah, the king, the judge, the lawgiver, the messenger of the Father, the only begotten El. Him, therefore, do we also preach to you, and declare him to be El the Word, who ministered to his El and Father for the creation of the world. By believing in him you shall live, but by disbelieving you shall be punished. For he that is disobedient to the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of Elohim abides on him. Yahukanon 3.36 Therefore, after you have... Oh, this goes on to, to keep... Uh, it goes on about the festivals and what to do. So that part isn't quite as important here. The important part was covering just who our Mashiach is and the fact that he is the wisdom or Chokmah from Elohim that appeared to men that created all things by the will of the Father. And it is not in the tree that the serpent beguiled Hua into eating. So Ab willing. You all can see that, and there's no confusion for anyone. Getting back on track here. <clears throat> That's why I we put the knowledge of the tree of good and evil here instead of the tree of wisdom, because that is a Gnostic belief. All right. So moving on, chapter 33. And it says, And from there I went to the ends of the land and saw great beasts, and each different from the other, and birds also differing in appearance and beauty and voice, the one different from the other. And to the east of those beasts, 
I saw the ends of the land whereon the Shemaim rests, where the firmament rests on the, the land or the waters, what we call Antarctica, or the Antarctic Circle, if you will. And the portals of the Shemaim open. And I saw how the stars of the Shemaim come forth, and I counted the portals out of which they proceed, and wrote down all their outlets of each individual star by itself, according to their number and their names, their courses and their positions, and their times and their months, as Oriel, the Kodesh messenger who was with me, showed me. He showed all things to me and wrote them down for me. Also their names he wrote for me and their laws and their companies. So you see that it was not only written by Hanok, but it was written by Oriel, and that would have been the two witnesses. And this is why all the ancient, all the ancient nations had different, different names for when the languages were changed for the constellations, but the same meanings in them. And when you look at, um, what is that, E.W. Bollinger's Witness of the Stars or Francis Rosalind's The Maserot, and they go over the literal names of the stars and it tells the good news account, this is where that comes from. Because it was originally given to Hanok and, and passed down to posterity. All right, this is, this is uh, the end of it right here. It's very small, so we'll just cover that real quick. And then when we continue next time, it will be on um, the parable or the vision, the second vision that he saw. So chapter 34. And from there I went towards the north to the ends of the land. And there I saw a great and magnificent device at the ends of the whole land. And here I saw three portals of the Shemaim open in the Shemaim, or heavens. Through each of them proceed north winds. When they blow, there is cold, hail, frost, snow, dew, and rain. And out of one portal they blow for good. But when they blow through the other two portals, it is with violence and affliction on the land. And they blow with violence. And from there, chapter 35. And from there I went towards the west to the ends of the land, and saw there three portals of the Shemaim open, such as I had seen in the east, the same number of portals, and the same number of outlets. Chapter 36. And from there I went to the south, to the ends of the land, and saw there... Three open portals of the Shemaim, and from there came dew, rain, and wind. And from there I went to the east to the ends of the Shemaim, and saw here the three eastern portals of the Shemaim open, and small portals above them. Through each of the small portals passed the stars of the Shemaim and run their course to the west on the path which is shown to them. And as often as I saw, I barak always Yahuwah of esteem. And I continued to barak Yahuwah of esteem, who has wrought great and magnificent wonders, to show the greatness of his work to the messengers, and to the Ruach Oath, or spirits, and to men, that they might praise his work in all his creation, that they might see the work of his hand, or sorry, the work of his, I think it should say, made in praise the great work of his hands and Barak him forever. Sorry about that. I think there's a typo. They might see the work of his hand. It says right there. All right, well, I'll have to check that out next time. I'm sorry. But it says that he should make, we shall see the work and praise the great work of his hands and Barak him forever, which is absolutely true. All of creation is made to, for the esteem of Elohim and by his good pleasure and for his good pleasure. So thank you all for your time. 
You have a wonderful rest of your Shabbat and a great week ahead. And we will see you next time. Shalom.